Well, the NLN stands for the National League for Nursing, and it's one of our big professional nursing organization, organizations in America. The mission and the focus on this organization is focused on nursing education and research. They provide, they, they want to prepare the nurse educators to prepare students, you know, to transition to uh, nursing practice. Also, they offer research grants and research opportunities to conduct research in the state of nursing science, which is all important for our profession. As I said, it's one of, uh, one of several organizations in the United States to this organization for many, many years, over 20 years. The National League for Nursing does a lot with its members through groups, task groups, committees, task force. What's so important, uh, me personally, uh, in LN, I became a program director, large simulation study that was conducted back in 2002. I worked with eight different program coordinators at the, uh, across the United States to conduct simulation work. Out of this simulation research, this is where that first book uh, that I developed in 2007, it was called uh, Simulation in Nursing Education from Conceptualization to Evaluation. So this book was born out of this first NLN project that started in 2002 with eight different program coordinators that I was directing. Also, um, my work with NLN, uh, specifically, if you want to know about vSIM, worked with them. I actually was a beta tester when they worked with Lairdell Corporation uh, to develop vSIMs because we went the direction for virtual simulations. To use in high fidelity mannequins, we were looking at the you know computer based virtual. So I was a beta tester at that point and found you know vSIMs are very important, which we'll talk more about in the interview um, for our students who are learning online in a virtual audience. About that shortly. So the NLN Jeffries theory it serves as a guide, implement, and evaluate clinical simulations. It's a, it's a roadmap, if you will, provides us direction how to do this. There are various components outlined in the theory that are important to consider when an, education or, when an educator or researcher is embracing the use of simulations in their course. Two major components of the theory are participants, which can be students, new graduates, or working nurses, a facilitator, which is known as the teacher, but we call them a facilitator, or the orientation instructor, whoever's going to run and lead the simulation. Other major components of the theory include the outcomes and outcomes. When we produce a simulation, there are outcomes that are produced, and they either affect three areas. One, the individual or the participant outcomes. So if, we were, if we were running a simulation on managing pain, I would ask, did the participant or the learner learn to manage pain, if that was what the simulation was about? We also look at, um, that's a, a participant. Also, we look at a second outcome, and that could be patient outcomes. So conduct simulations or produce a simulation-based curriculum. Are we affecting patients? Are we producing high-quality care on the other side when we're using this simulation uh, mechanism? Patient outcomes, which are more challenging to measure, but using a simulation-based curriculum with our learners, we can impact on the other side in clinical practice whether we're affecting outcomes. So that's an important evaluation. Lastly, we can produce what are called system outcomes, which through a simulation-based pedagogy, we can look at systems. Are we affecting the hospital unit or the hospital? culture or whatever we're looking on uh, for a system to change. Finally, another major component of the NLN Jeffries is how to design a simulation. How do we enhance these learning outcomes? What's included in the theory? What is evidence-based that need to guide us on how to develop a good simulation? There are different components of designing a simulation that are found in the theory. One, simulations need objectives, participant. So you list three to five objectives so they know what the simulation is about. 
Two is fidelity or realism. The simulation must mimic clinical practice or a clinical event. Three, there's usually problem solving components within the simulation. When you do a scenario, either there's one, two, th or three problems, however you want. More problems equals increased complexity. So the problems are embedded in the scenario as the student assesses the patient and discovers, oh, there's a problem with the diabetes. Oh, the patient's got also hypertension and we're dealing with uh, the medications to control that. So there's several problems that you incorporate for the student to assess and to problem solve. Or another component in the simulation based on the theory is participant support. Students feel supported in using simulations as a learning mechanism. And we have what's called debriefing or guided reflection feedback. This is after a simulation. The students need to hear what they did right or wrong. Those are the components of the simulation. It kind of, the theory itself gives uh, an educator a roadmap on how to develop a simulation, how to test it, looking at the outcomes. Overall, this NLN Jeffries theory is a mid-range theory that has uh, studied by many researchers and declared a mid-range theory. I hope that helps. If I'm a beginning educator or even a seasoned educator and I'm starting new educational inno innovations and interventions, because I would say I want to start simulations in my program, look at evidence-based practice. I want, I want to use a, a theor theoretical basis on how to build simulation. Why would I start over and try to make it up myself? I want to go back to the literature. I want to go back to the science, to the theory. And this theory has been tested, meaning many studies have tested these components. And so these are the components. When you build a simulation, this is based on evidence. So therefore, if I'm adopting or embracing new simulations in my program, I need to, why would I not build on the science? Because it's been studied and we know what works and what doesn't work. So that's what I tell uh, the educators. You, you want to go the right direction. You want to build on the evidence for best teaching practices. Well, when we wrote the article, I was with uh, some of my colleagues the article was focusing on how an educator can use vSIM and also the results from learner perspective. Did they learn vSIMs or not? Did, they, did that provide a good learning experience? So at the time, vSIM was very, very new. It was a new approach in using simulation. But one of the advantages, of course, of vSIM is the notion that students can practice and go through the simulation over and over and over to improve and understand the scenario and the procedure and the nursing interventions we are outlining. When I did that, we wanted to look at the data since it was a new pedagogy, it was all new. We wanted to see, well, does it work? Does it not work? You know, tell us more about it. So that's what the study we were asking students about, uh, if they liked the approach and the information they were giving us that you found in the article. The students did uh, like the approach. They felt they could control their learning, you know, on their own. They could move at their own pace using vSIMs. Um, they can practice over and over. And also vSIMs provided the educational mobility for our students to promote learning anytime, anywhere. So they can go in, you know, at midnight if they want to study don't have to wait on their instructor, you know, tomorrow at eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. So it provides that mobility. Well, to integrate vSIM into the classroom, I work with instructors mm -hmm. and the instructors, they assign the vSIM as an assignment. Maybe on Tuesday, September 5th, you need to go through these three vSIMs. Mm -hmm. They're on cardiovascular care of the heart patient. I want them to go through vSIMs before they come to the simulation space using high quality simulators. So I might assign it vSIMs before they ever come in and practice a little bit on simulations and decision making before they come into the lab. So that's one approach. Okay. Another approach may be uh, 
where I live in Washington, D.C., we have winter. We have a lot of snow. School is closed. The faculty, they can't, the teacher can't, they can't get the, uh, students can't go to clinical. So the teacher may assign VSIMs and say, you know, do these and complete for your clinical assignment and I will check your scores and we will discuss later. If a specific example, maybe a student was ill or in the hospital and couldn't come to clinical, but clinical makeup, you know, makeup for this time, I might assign a student these VSIMs and discuss those VSIMs to make sure that student understood the content, or say of a cardiovascular patient. So it substituted, I would say, for real practicum time. And then when I talk to the student after going through the VSIMs, as an instructor, I will know, do, this, do the students really understand this or not? You know, it's a good learning tool. Well, what's so important for faculty now? VSIMs are developed. They've been for best practices. This goes back to the theory. They've been developed using evidence-based practices. And to help the faculty, I don't have to create these scenarios. No. I'm as faculty. This is, this is a product I can purchase and incorporate in my corp, uh, program or my curriculum. Uh, and and I, I know they've been tested. Also, the learner, the student, the participant, they go through the simulation, they get feedback. In the computer-based learning, it says, yes, yay, you passed it. No, you need to do this over. You know, there's, uh, this was incorrect because they give you the rationale. As a faculty, that really is helpful because they're already ready-made. It, it, they engage the student. And third, I get a score. I can tell right away if a student did it, if they fell because of the score, and then I can help the student where they, I meet the student where they are, you know. Okay. If they need in this area, I can see from VSIMS, then I, I need to provide help in that area. So based on my experience, and thank you for asking that question, I would incorporate the use of simulations in the beginning with our beginning learners and great simulations such as vSIM throughout the curriculum. Over the two years, over the three years, I look for an integrated sustainable model using simulations. When they only use it once a year here, a little bit here, I, it's, it's hard to measure if they're learning from them. But I like the same integrated model. So I would start with students from the beginning so they get used to using simulations and this type of learning. Um, helpful. They usually want more of it. And it's also helpful to instructors because these are scenarios are already designed. So I think these provide a learning mechanism for students to understand the content related to a patient case. VSIMs provide learning and practice environments. Uh, they get to practice, you know, taking care of that diabetic patient in a virtual world. Uh, then they get feedback from the VSIMS program, if they did it right, if they did it wrong. And if they did it wrong, they get to go back in and do it again. And then they see a different score and, and good feedback. VSIMS provides a way to practice. The students can do it over and over or in a repetitive fashion. And they can practice and to enhance their learning of knowledge and skills. What I've seen, VSIMS is very realistic. Mm -hmm. Are realistic so the learners learn, they see real clinical situation. In addition, VSIMs, it's easy to navigate. You got these students coming in, they're high tech. They're, a lot of them are millennials. They, they want technology, they get it. They can navigate through it very, very easily to make learning easy, fun, and convenient. Convenient, they can, they can do it at their kitchen table, they can do it on the train, on their phone. They can do things very, very easily. And students get immediate feedback. They get a score at the end, and that's satisfying. They want a score. You know, did I do it right? You see a lot of these students doing gaming, you know, games on their computers. <laughs> the VSIMS also is an engaged activity, and they get scores. So e-learning through the use of VSIMS, 
incursions, typically welcomed by students, uh, they it can do their own. They can learn on their own at their own time. Uh, they're used to being on computers. This they it, they find you know learning on the computer. I think helpful and motivating because they grew up with this. And students also, when you do do the virtual sim, they get scores. Well, students are competitive. They want good. They want to do well. They want to be great nurses. So even if they didn't get a, a score, they will go back and do it again to get a better score because they want to. They want to be good. So I've seen that in learning behavior where students will go back, even if they got a ninety instead of a hundred, they will go back and get a hundred. They will try and try till they get that top score. So I think that's good for students as a learning method. Uh, it it stimulates them, challenges. Uh, to do well. well, you need to provide, you need to communicate very clearly mm -hmm. message about the use of vSIMs and why we see these are important. Almost a campaign, why vSIMs? Yeah. The fact that you tell the students, you know, why are we using this methodology to learn? Why is it important? How is it going to be helpful? Also, all the students, the learners, need to learn how to, they have to have an orientation on vSIMs. How do we do it? How do we do it well? What are the tools? How do we get the answers, uh, you know, at the end to learn our, about our scores? So a good orientation. And then third, uh, instructors, faculty need to know how to do vSIMs. If they're going to assign vSIMs to students, then faculty need to understand. So that goes to instructor or faculty development. Make sure all the faculty have gone through these vSIMs and they know what they're doing. So they can answer students' questions and understand the richness of this product. Also, another tip, I think, with faculty, instructors, if I've assigned four vSIMs, say for a half a day or as a clinical makeup, I had snow, I want to debrief with the students about vSIMs. Okay. So Discussion, whether it's with a small group of students or online one-to-one, -one, but I want them to tell me any questions. What did you not understand? Mm -hmm. And going over the scenario. And lastly, I would say integrate the throughout the nursing program. Don't just do it one time and be done, mm -hmm. but in for every semester from the beginning to the end. So real clinical time, I can assign these VSIMs instead of you know, half a day in clinical, they may be doing vSIMs because I think they're learning, you know, clinical behaviors and intervention through vSIMs. So if it's possible in Japan, as in the United States, we can substitute clinical time. So that's one. Another way, it might, might be lab time. If I've got students in lab to learn more about the diabetic patient, I might substitute lab time for virtual sims. So sometimes our students, when we, they go to simulation for lab, we have scenarios, just like you find them, their scenario. They have a patient. We mm -hmm. give them information. They have to go assess and take care of the patient. Uh, going in the sim lab, because maybe it's too crowded and I have the schedule is tight, I must just say, you know, students, this week we're going to do four vSIMs. So I'm substituting that lab time for vSIMs. vSIMs can always be a supplement. Mm -hmm. so it's not substituting anything, but you can say this week to enhance your learning, to make your learning better, mm -hmm. I want you to go through these four VSIMs mm -hmm. and talk about them. You can also do one in class, I'm teaching about the diabetic patient, but have an interaction in class. I pull this up on my computer as a faculty mm -hmm. in front of all, you know, 100 students. And then we go through it together, mm -hmm. you know, what to do. And then students give me answer, then we follow through so they see it. Oh, I definitely see learning in the future. Uh, virtual simulations, just like vSIMs. Uh, our learners are no longer, you know, many of them don't want to come to class on Wednesday at 3 o'clock. <laughs> they want to learn anytime, any place. Mm -hmm. they're, they're traveling, they're doing this. So they squeeze their learning in between these other life activities. So, yes. See e-learning it now and in the future, it'll only be bigger and better. So that's a very real situation. We have that in the States too, where sometimes administration 
they buy into it. Yay, it's good. Others saying, no, no, we'll stay with our same old way. Change. So we also have those challenges. What I do, uh, well, you have to get buy-in from the leader. Mm-hmm. And if you get buy-in from few leaders that are powerful, they can serve as examples. Mm-hmm. So when the leaders incorporate it and then make visible, do stories about those successes. Mm-hmm. Oh, the school uses vSIMs. Oh, these students are very satisfied. Their learning is enhanced. You know, you can do stories. I tend to work with the early adopters for those who want to embrace technology in new ways. And then I do success stories and make them very visible. And then what happens sometimes the mid adopters will come on because they say, oh, I think I can do this too. So they start seeing themselves in it. I just, I work with those who want to embrace it. And then the people that are naysayers, I tend to save them for last of energy.